everyone. Welcome to everyone who's watching on YouTube and Facebook. This is our fourth in this fourth um, session on the series on Anglicanism. And today we're talking about the Book of Common Prayer. First of all, a comment on the on the saints for this week. Yesterday was the saint was the feast of Saint Bartholomew. Today is the feast of Saint Louis, King of France. Um, something you know about Saint Louis, if you've ever been to Paris and been to Saint Chapelle, maybe the most beautiful chapel in all of Christendom. Google the chapel of Saint Chapelle. It is nothing but stained glass. And it's the most beautiful space with colored stained glass I've ever, ever seen. Um, King Louis built this for the relics of our Lord's um, passion. Um, but um, he, his relics are now transferred there. Completely beautiful. But the comment I want to make is that yesterday for the feast of St. Bartholomew, I mean, the fact of the matter is we know, we know essentially nothing about Bartholomew. Some scholars think that perhaps he was, he's also Nathaniel, but all we really know is that he is in the list of the disciples. We have no record of him doing anything in the Gospels. He didn't say anything like Peter or Thomas. We have no recollection or, or information about what he did like Matthew, tax collector. Um, he wasn't in the inner circle like Peter, James, and John. There's no information given to him in the Acts of the Apostles. He's not mentioned in the letters of Paul or James or John. He doesn't appear in the Apocalypse. We have no idea anything about his, his occupation, anything about his, his spiritual character other than this, is that he's remembered as holy. And then today we remember uh, King Louis, who was unique among monarchs because he was known for his immense piety and faith. We're told that even underneath his royal garments, he would wear a hair shirt, a sign of, of penitence, to remind himself of his, of his um, to repent of his own desires. So the point I want to make is that on one hand, we have St. Bartholomew, who is essentially anonymous to us, and then King Louis, who was on grand display, both in their own way, were incredibly devout, who thirsted after the righteousness of God, and they're both in the calendar of saints. So for us, it doesn't really matter if we go through this life and no one has any idea of what we've done or what we do. We have a vocation to live a holy life. It doesn't matter if we've been put in a position of great uh, um, public um, display. That's no excuse. We have the call to live a holy and righteous life. It's one of the great gifts of keeping the calendar of the saints as a part of our daily rhythm is that we discover something about our own call and our own life with this great cloud of witnesses, those that no one knows anything about and others who built great chapels and we can go visit them. They both speak to us. So let's pray. O God, who didst call thy servant Louis of France to an earthly throne, that he might advance thy heavenly kingdom, and didst give him zeal for thy church and love for thy people, mercifully grant that we who commemorate him this day may be fruitful in good works and attain to the glorious crown of thy saints. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. So a couple of things. I need to hand those of you who um, just walked in a piece of paper. And I forget who just walked in. So if you need a piece of paper, will you let me know? Thank you. And while um, go ahead and pick up the prayer book that's in your pew. We will be going through it a little bit tonight. The Book of Common Prayer is the anthem of Anglicanism. 
mean, the fact of the matter is one could easily argue that Anglicanism, and remember the whole point of this series of lectures over the past um, couple of months has been what is distinctive about this tradition? To go back to the beginning, we want to make the case that we should uh, find great comfort and uh, spiritual fruit in this tradition, not because of what is lacking here, but, but what is found here. So one of the goals is to discover the positive, distinctive aspects of this tradition. But our tradition is complex and it's broad and there are many things and many expressions that you find in Anglicanism. Certainly in Winston-Salem, and this is not at all meant to be a critique, but of, of the Episcopal churches in Winston-Salem, and if all the rectors were in this room, they would agree with me 100%, you would have completely different experiences of, uh, of liturgy, of, of space. It's, it's just it's completely different, a wide range of expressions. But at the end of the day, the one irreducible element that binds all descendants of the Church of England together is the Book of Common Prayer. The Book of Common Prayer is in every parish church, right? It's in, it's in the pews here. It's in the pews in the chapel. It's given to confirmands, even if they never open it for the rest of their lives, they'll get one. It's in the Bible. When you're confirmed, you must get a Book of Common Prayer with your name written on the inside. It's given to ordinands, and this is commanded in the Book of Common Prayer. I still say morning and evening prayer in the chapel downstairs with the prayer book hymnal combination that was given to me at my diaconal ordination 16 years ago with my name in, incorrectly printed on the front. But I still use it. It's the subject of uh, veneration and the subject of constant calls for revision. Probably at every single general convention, there was a petition or a resolution or a call to revise the Book of Common Prayer and equal calls on the other, on the other side to say, don't you dare. Early in my days as rector here, there were quite a few people when we introduced printed bulletins to help people who were not familiar with our tradition to kind of have an idea what's going on, people were upset that we had them and said they should learn the prayer book, I was told. Which I didn't disagree, but it's an interesting statement of, uh, of the affection and the image of this um, that is so distinctive in our tradition. So it is what is distinctive about Anglicanism, but do we know why? And so that really is the question for those who were really upset that people weren't flipping through the prayer book, do we know why that would be important? We give it to confirmands, but why do we give it to confirmands? We give it to, uh, to, um, to ordinands oftentimes. Actually, the prayer book is not commanded in the, in the, in the ordinal, but we give it to um, ordinands. Why do we do that? Why do we have them in the pews? Why do we have prayer books in the pews and not Bibles in the pews oftentimes? We could and should have both, don't get me wrong, but if you had to pick, if you had to go to an Episcopal church, you would find a prayer book before you would find a Bible in the pew, right? Fair? Ones you've been to? Absolutely. Why? Why do we have the prayer book at all? That's where we have to begin. So two weeks ago, I rattled off the list of all the English prayer books, which I know you remember and committed them to, to heart and been writing them down on napkins to quiz yourself at stoplights and things like that. And I encouraged you to connect prayer books, the four English prayer books, with the monarchs that are associated with, associated with them. And if you can do that, then you've already done half the battle of, of remembering the trajectory of, 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 uh, of Anglicanism in the beginning. So there are four, 1549 and 1552. Who was the monarch? There was one monarch for both of those. 1549, 1552, who was the king or queen? Wrong. Tommy, I think I heard something. Wrong. Wrong. Mary was Roman Catholic for crying out loud. Who else? James. Wrong. The boy king. The coming of Josiah. 
Edward VI, 1549-1552, all right? So we have Edward dies, Mary comes to the throne, burns all the prayer books, I'm sure, and then we have the 1559 Book of Common Prayer. Who was responsible for that one? I'm terrified to ask. Elizabeth, Chloe, she beat you. Chloe gets the, 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 the gold star on that one. And then here's the one that may be a bit trickier. Uh, 1662. Who was the king or queen responsible for that one? No. Think North Carolina. King Charles the what? Second, yeah. No. King Charles the first lost his head, and then we had the, the, the Commonwealth, and then King Charles the second came, in, uh, and then was restored to the monarchy, and then in 1662, put out the Book of Common Prayer. Those aren't just dates to remember, just so I can pick on you. Um, if you can remember those dates, and remember the context of those dates, you start to understand more and more about the history of the Book of Common Prayer. We're not going to do the social history of the Book of Common Prayer. We're not going to do the mechanical history of it. There is a lot written on all of this, and it's, I think it's interesting. Some of it's even enlightening, but it's not really the point of what I want to get to um, tonight, but just to say there is an awful, awful, awful lot. I'm not even going to begin to, to to touch on this. So please don't walk away thinking I'm summing up everything in maybe the 30 or so minutes we'll have tonight. But we need to begin with Archbishop Cranmer, Thomas Cranmer, who was the Archbishop of Canterbury for Henry VIII and Edward VI. And I would suggest getting the Book of Common Prayer and go to page 866. I do encourage you that if you ever find yourself in church, and I give you full permission, if you ever find yourself in church and your mind starts to wander, if the homily gets a little dry, whatever else, and you've already examined every bit of the triptych and everything else, open the prayer book and then go to the back and there's lots of good things to read and no one will think you're doing anything impious because they'll just think you're praying in the prayer book. And one of the things that is that I guarantee you probably have never read or didn't know was there, but it's actually very, very interesting, is the preface to the first Book of Common Prayer in 1549, which is included uh, in its entirety on page, pages 866 and 867. You found it? You're there? It's terribly tiny on my print. Hopefully it's better in yours. I'm not going to read the whole thing to you, and fortunately in this edition it's been updated in terms of spelling and things like that. Um, you can also find this in the original spelling, um, how they would spell things in the 16th century online for free. But in this, Archbishop Cranmer lays out the reasons why the prayer book was necessary at all. And basically, when I read it, I come away with at least three things that he's getting at. He doesn't list them and say, here's number one, here's number two, and here's number three. But I think if you read them, um, it's, um, it's very, very interesting. He begins the first sentence with, there was never anything by the wit of man so well devised or so sure established, which in continuance of time hath not been corrupted. What he's saying is, there's never been anything on this planet that had, where human beings had a hand in it, where after a period of time, they didn't mess it up. That's how he's beginning. So he's saying that in the beginning, there was a, a, a purity of prayer. But if you just give it enough time, we'll screw it up somehow. And that's, that's the case he's making. So how was it messed up? Basically, he says, is that over time, it, the amount of scripture that was read was sliced and diced, and it was, there was more omitted than included. Now, for instance, um, go to page, you may want to put a little dog here on page 866, and go to page 768.
Page 768, Psalm 119, and then look at verse 62. Let's just read that in unison. At midnight, I will rise to give you thanks. Then flip over to, um, to page uh, 777. In the same psalm, And we'll read the first part of verse 164 together. Seven times a day do I praise you. So in verse 62, we have, uh, at midnight I rise to give you thanks. And then verse 164, seven times a day do I praise you. This is the biblical foundation for the eight times of prayer for monks and nuns in Western Christianity. The, and th this is the order of prayer. You would wake up at midnight to say matins. That is verse 62, at midnight I rise to, uh, to give you thanks. And then in the day hours, you would have um, uh, lauds, prime, terse, sext, nun, vespers, and compline for each of the hours of day. Lauds would be right, right before daybreak, prime, you can figure this out, one, the first hour. And what do you guess the first hour of the day would be? Give me a, give me a time associated with it. What's a good logical starting place for the day? 6 a.m., right? So terse, what do you think terse is? It's the third hour. Not three o'clock, but the third hour. Nine. Sext, six, not 6 p.m., but noon, none, ninth hour, three, and then you have Vespers, and then Compline. Compline looks and sounds an awful lot like completion. It's the end, um, coming to the end of the day. Um, Lord, grant us a, a peaceful night and a perfect, complete, um, perfect end. So that's what the rhythm of prayer was for monks and nuns. Those are called religious. So when you're, when you're thinking about in ecclesiastical context and you talk about the religious were saying their prayers, they don't mean necessarily the pious lay folk in the village, but the, but the monks and nuns, the, the, the religious orders. Also the clergy were also um, expected to say the canonical hours. Um, the priests wouldn't get up at midnight, I'm certain, but they would say their, their bravery in doing that. So the problem is what they would do, and you can still pick up old breveries, and they would have the matins and vespers and a couple others would be longer than others, but some would be pretty, pretty short. Like in our, in our prayer book today, if you've ever done noonday prayer, for instance, it doesn't take long at all to do it. You can do it in, in five minutes. And if you'll notice on noonday prayer, um, in fact, just go to Noonday Prayer. Go to, it's on page, let's just make it easier. Um, noonday Prayer is on page 103. When you get there, you'll see that it, it, there's a handful of psalms that you can say all of them or, uh, you know, a portion of them, but there are only three psalms, one, a portion of 119, 121, uh, and 126, and then you have the choice of three selections of Scripture, the longest ones only four lines, and then you have the, the you know, the Kyrie, the our Father, and then you have four prayers from which you can choose from. You can say all four or you can do one. Not a lot of variety. Max three psalms, max three short readings, max four prayers. That's it. So imagine more of these during the day of being a little bit longer, but you still see very select portions of Scripture. 150 psalms, right? But you're only getting, you know, um, two and a half. Not even two and a half, because Psalm 119 is 170 something verses, and this is only, you know, seven or eight. So you get the idea that you could do your canonical duty of saying all the offices, but you're only getting a sentence here, a sentence here, a psalm here, a psalm there. And so Thomas Cranmer was saying, what's happened is, is that we've sliced and diced Holy Scripture so much that basically our clergy, our monks and nuns don't know them. 
And not only do they not know them, but they don't know them in any kind of real great context because there's no continuous reading of Scripture. It's again, it's a verse here, a verse here, a verse there. And we all know the dangers of just cherry picking Scripture verses here and there. You can make them say whatever you want to. We need the context to it. So if the monks and the nuns and the, and the parish clergy don't know a lot of Scripture and they're not saturated in Scripture in their prayer, what is going to be the net effect on the people? They're not going to know it either if the people who are doing the preaching and the teaching don't know it and are not immersed in it in their prayers. That's going to trickle down and you'll have spiritual uh, poverty among the people. So that's one thing that he really wanted to address. He wanted to have more Scripture. And he wanted to have Scripture in more continuous selections and not a verse here and not a verse there. So that's one thing. The other thing, uh, go back to page 866, is complexity. Now, there is one sentence, it's, um, and I am, I am six months from bifocals. If you go to the one, two, if you go to the second paragraph, and you go to the last line, he says, moreover, the number and hardness of the rules called the pi, this is a reference to um, a resource that was published for clergy telling them how to find uh, what to pray on certain days, and there may have been a chart that was color-coded and all of that, called the pie, and the manifold changings of the service was the cause that to turn the book only was so hard and intricate a matter that many times there was more business to find out what should be read than to read it when it was found out. Now, that's complex 16th century language, what he's saying is, and he's absolutely right, is that because there was so much to do and the, and the calendar was very complex, beautiful but complex, that I remember, and I have a, a, an Anglican breviary, which is a prayer book version of, prayer book language version and prayer book Psalter version of the old Roman breviary, when I try to do it, it literally, no exaggeration, takes me longer to find out in the tables and charts what I'm supposed to pray and to arrange my ten ribbons than it actually takes me to pray the office. He's completely correct on that. It became so burdensome. And remember, there was no online um, resource. He just didn't go to, you know, bravery.com and it'll tell you exactly what to do. They had to figure it out and they were wasting time not saying their prayers but trying to figure out how to do it. So he wanted simplification of the process, of the rules. He wasn't against order, but he wanted the rules fewer and he wanted them to be simplified. The other thing is uniformity. So if you go 866 and you go to, uh, on page 867, the first full paragraph that begins with, and where heretofore, there hath been great diversity in saying and singing in churches within this realm, some following Salisbury use, some Hereford use, some the use of Bangor, some the use of or York and S Ork, that's where Mork is from, some the use of York and some of Lincoln, now, from here henceforth, all the whole realm should have but one use. And if any would judge this way more painful, because that all things must be read upon the book, meaning we've got to learn a new way of doing it, whereas before, by reason of so often repetition, they could say many things by heart. If those men will weigh their labor with the profit and knowledge which daily they shall obtain by reading upon the book, they will not refuse the pain in consideration of the great profit that shall ensue thereof. So basically he's saying we could all now be on the same page. And he's anticipating the argument. I know it's, it's just completely embedded and embossed in your soul, and you can do it by heart, but if you could just endure the pain, the benefits would be so much greater. While we're on that paragraph, though, if you go down um, to the last paragraph, 
This is interesting. This is important to note. He says, though it be appointed in the aforewritten preface that all things shall be read and sung in the church in the English tongue, to the end that the congregation may, thereby, may be thereby edified, yet it is not meant. But when men say matins and even song privately, that they may say the same in any language that they themselves do understand. What is he really getting at here? He's saying that to uh, assuage anxiety and devotion and practice. What is, what is, what's, what's he allowing? Well, what, lang- what language do you think he's talking about? Latin, absolutely. So oftentimes there is this trope that, that there was this real kind of um, push against Latin because it was associated with Romanism. I don't think Cranmer had a problem with it. What did he really want? What was his main goal? What was his main overarching goal in, in more scripture, simplification of the, of the rules and rubrics, and uniformity, what does all that bring us to, to trying to discern what he really wanted to happen in the Book of Common Prayer? What did he want to happen? He wanted the people to be edified, and to, yes, and to be, and to be immersed in Scripture, and to have a life of prayer of their own, and not to make it so unattainable, so out of reach, so complex, so um, uh, not to be even be able to be understood. So there was this great move to bring the clergy and to immerse and enrich them and the fruits of of our faith, but also the people. Hence, we have a devotional um, element in the name of this project immediately, the Book of Common Prayer. I think it's a beautiful preface, actually, and what he's trying to accomplish and everything he he was looking for, I think he's right. And I think in in the time he was living in, very, very valid things. And he wasn't alone. I mean, we have to remember that when he was compiling the the first Book of Common Prayer, and I think it's fair to say we we need to have some discipline in, say, compiling, editing. It wasn't created from whole cloth. It wasn't from scratch. He was translating. He was borrowing things from the continent. I think he was borrowing things from Reformed sources. He was also borrowing things maybe from Roman Catholic sources because there was still a movement in the Roman Catholic Church to maybe reform and simplify. I mean, they were seeing some of the same things as well. He did create some collects. He did write some. But there's a combination of original compositions within the existing tradition. So when he wrote a collect, he composed a collect, he wasn't creating a new form of prayer. He was following the same uh, the rules and traditions and customs of doing them, but he was taking something that was in um, many different volumes and a diversity of use to the point there was no real Catholicity in the prayer and very difficult to get your hands on, both literally and figuratively, in one volume, for clergy and laity, and something that had the promise of bearing real spiritual fruit. But also recognizing that in your own devotions, if you want to say Pater Noster, go for it. It's not going to bother him at all. More scripture, greater simplicity in praying, and uniformity. So how does he, how does it, how does this happen? What does he do? So I've given you, in the piece of paper, I've given you essentially the table of contents for the 1549 Book of Common Prayer. This is not simply the history of the 1549. We're using the first Book of Common Prayer because it was the first to show how everything that followed flows from this emphasis that he's given. And so there are 11 basically chapters. There is the calendar, calendar with a K, coming from the German word for calendar, that in in churchy use, you would use the calendar with a K to talk about the the prayer calendar as opposed to meetings and things like that. So that's why we use it. It's It's not a typo. 
Morning and evening prayer, 1549, it was called Matins and Evensong. The propers, meaning the introits, collects, epistles, and gospels for the Mass, the Holy Eucharist, baptism, confirmation, matrimony, visitation of the sick, burial, purification of women, and there was prayers to be said on the first day of Lent, commonly called Ash Wednesday. There, there was no imposition of ashes on Ash Wednesday. That's not in the prayer book, but the prayer book called it Ash Wednesday, sort of recognizing the tradition, even if, even if the act itself wasn't present, um, it was a recognition of the tradition, okay? So, a couple of things that, that we are used to having in our prayer books now that, aren't, that were not in the first one. One would be the Psalter. The other one would be the Litany, which we don't do as often as perhaps we should. And the, and the, the last one would be the Ordinal, meaning the, the liturgy for making deacon, deacons, priests, and bishops. Now, the Litany and the Ordinal existed, but they were in different volumes. And there's some evidence that it was intended to be put in the same book um, later, and it was. Okay? Now, what do you see in this table of contents? Does anything jump off the page at you? It's not a trick question. Um, I mean, there is, there is an answer I'd like us to move toward, but what, what, what do you see, Mary Jean? Purification of women is the churching of women. Basically, in 1549, more so than in 2021, giving birth is a life or death situation. And then if you are, and I love the old English language. We, we say that you know, Jane Doe gave birth um, and delivered a baby. What's the old language? Jane Doe was delivered of a child. She was delivered, she was delivered from the child because this thing may, may kill her and then after, after, the, after she has been safely delivered of a child, there's a, um, there is a, a purification in the old biblical sense but also prayers of thanksgiving for safe delivery and all of that. A very common pastoral approach. And that's one of the things I really want you to see. I want you to see the three things that are here. There is a rhythm of how to pray, of how to pattern your life with the calendar. And then there is the morning and evening prayers. And then we have all of the sacraments present, excluding ordination, which is in a different volume. But they're all there. Baptism is there. The Holy Eucharist is there. Confirmation is there. Matrimony is there. On number eight, you had anointing and confession Confession, auricular confession, is, was contained within the rite of um, visitation of the sick. So that's our six, and then we have ordination at a later one. So how to pattern your life, how to say your prayers, all of the sacraments that, that Christ has given to the church, and we have real pastoral responses, burial of the dead, and, um, and the purification of women. I excluded matrimony, I think, in my list of sacraments, but you see it's there. So imagine being in England, 16th century. This addresses everything, really, right? Everything you need. Magnificent, in one volume. It was the perfect, portable manual for prayer and the Christian life. In one volume for both clergy and the laying. Again, we have the rhythm of prayer, what are the days of the saints' days? And what do I read today? And what Cranmer did is that he, he gave out a list of how to read the Bible, and it wasn't a verse here, a verse here. It was significant portions of the same book going in, in succession. The eight offices have now brilliantly been compressed into two. And I say brilliantly because there are wonderful elements of the eight offices in their correct positions in morning and evening prayer. The best example is, is the, the Benedictus, the Song of Zechariah that you would have a uh, morning prayer would be in the, in the early morning offices. The Magnificat and the Nunc Dimittis that we do at evening prayer would, be, would have been in Vespers and Compline, respectively. 
It's a beautiful, just combining and collapsing uh, into two. And then the sacra- oh, and then um, the first thing that he included right after his preface. So in 1549, there is the preface. You turn the page, and then it tells you how to read the Psalms. And now, not a psalm here, not a psalm there, but all 150 psalms read every single month. And he tells us how to do it. And then later, the psalms were printed in the prayer book as well. So there's no more having to consult the directorium, pi, whatever else. It's there. And today, it's a brilliantly done. If you come to morning and evening prayer regularly, we will post the psalms on the board for convenience. And also because every now and then when you have a, saint's day, have a saint's day, it throws it out of whack. But most people who come quickly learn how to discover that in our current prayer book, when you go to the Psalms, like go to, um, go to page, uh, let's see, go to page, go to page 772. This is Cranmer's legacy that we still uh, live in. On page 772, you see that right after verse 104 in Psalm 119, in italics, 26th day morning prayer. So if you come to morning prayer tomorrow, that's where the Psalms begin, because it's the 26th day of the month, and that's morning prayer. And then we'll go all the way until um, verse 144, where it says, uh, where then you have the line 26th day evening prayer all 150. And then what happens when you have 31 days? Cranmer said, do day 30 again. It's good for you. And then you get all 150 psalms in, um, and maybe even an extra if you have 31 days. So now the practice of religion was not confined to the cloister of the monastery, but could now be uniformly practiced by both clergy and laity alike, following the same book, literally reading off the same page. And that's not to say that Christians in England before 1549 didn't have their own devotions. They absolutely did. doesn't mean they didn't have their own devotional books. They absolutely did. But this was an introduction into the common spiritual life of more Scripture, greater simplicity, which made it easier to do. So you'd have to spend 30 minutes trying to figure out how to say the prayers and then pray them for 15, and then uniformity. And that has remained the same up until now, from all the four English prayer books to all the ones we've had in the United States. If you go to our, I mean, if you go to, in fact, do that, go to our table of contents on page, um, well, it's no page. Just go to the table of contents right after the title page, and you see basically the same thing. There's the calendar of the church year, the daily office, morning and evening prayer, but now we've added noonday prayer, we've added Compline. There's now the great litany in there, the, the collects of the year are in there, proper liturgies for special days are in there, which is sort of our current uh, incarnation of the introits, collects, and uh, epistles and gospels. Holy baptism, the Holy Eucharist, confirmation, marriage, um, uh, unction, confession, they're all there. All the sacraments are there because we'll have ordination later in the, in the book. We have those pastoral needs, um, being, when someone, being with someone when they die, burying of the dead. And then uh, Mary June on page 439, thanksgiving for the birth or adoption of a child is a modern version of churching of women and thanksgiving after childbirth. The the Psalter is there in its entirety, along with some other things. So yeah, it's very much the exact same thing, seeking to serve the exact same purpose. There is no other tradition that I can think of that combines both the public acts of worship with the common prayers of the laity into one volume that is economical, accessible, and grounded in tradition. It is completely unique to 
Anglicanism. I mean, the Roman Catholics have the Liturgy of Hours in four volumes that the clergy and the religious are bound to say. They have the Missal, they have the Pontifical, they have other books. The Orthodox have the Liturgy of St. John Chrysostom, they have another divine liturgy, they have the Great Book of Needs, they have, you know, Akathists, and they have uh, uh, other, other services, and several different books, and so on and so forth. But for, the, but for the most part, now we do have other books, to be fair, but for the most part, all we really need to live out our life is contained in this one book that I can literally put in my coat pocket. That really is an extraordinary thing. So, and, and by, the, by the way, that one book, as small as it may be, it is not deficient in its substance. That's the beauty, that's the power of it. Here's an example. Today, today's been a, um, a typical full day. I led morning prayer in one chapel. I said mass in the church. After that, I went to, to visit um, two different hospices and said the litany of the dying and anointed um, someone who was at, at the last stages of their life, um, did evening prayer, all of this from one book. Doing this entire rhythm of both corporate and private prayer and devotion, of doing our duty to God by saying our, our prayers and praying for the church and the world, but also being with people at their most vulnerable, at the place where we so desire hope and grace and love and mercy at the hour of our death. And it all came from this one great, beautiful resource. All that we need to have a vigorous, life in Jesus Christ is presented in the book of common prayer. Comments, questions, thoughts. There was a lot of burning during Mary's time, yeah. Did, did any, did any, uh, any say that Sure, yeah. Have you seen you know, love or no? How big was I am almost certain I've seen one, um, and I don't remember where, probably in, um, if not the British Museum or someplace like that. Um, they oftentimes would be very, very small. No, I have, I've only seen, um, in fact, I think Neshota House had, had a 1549. The ones that I would see would be what the wealthy could afford for personal use. So I have never seen, and what probably was destroyed would be altar versions. Those likely did not survive, but those that you could keep in your home for devotions and say your prayers. They would be about this size, maybe a bit smaller. But they're also very, very portable. I have, if you go to my office, I have, I love to collect old prayer books and devotional manuals. And again, as I am months from, from progressive lenses, uh, they're really, really difficult to, to see because the, the, I mean, it's, it's economics. It's, it's, I guess, cheaper to make a smaller book. There's less paper, less, you know, there's less vellum you need, whatever, to, to bind it. Um, but also, it was, a, it was a personal devotional item that you would, you would keep with you, um, and not these massive things that, that we oftentimes have here. Um, let me say that you may think to yourself, well, that sounds well and good, that I'm glad the prayer book is simplified from what it was in, in the early 16th century, but I still find it quite complicated. I get that. I get that. Um, but I would encourage you to, to trust that the way to, to pray the prayer book is not insurmountable. There is a learning curve. There's a learning curve for anything. But once we, once we allow that anxiety to fall away and to recognize that it is designed for us to do both together but also individually, we can absolutely understand all that is required of us and then, and then really have a fruitful encounter with Jesus Christ through this great tradition, which is the Western Catholic tradition through the lens of, of an English context and experience now passed on into our American context 
and experience. And the best way to do that for morning and evening prayer, honestly, people would always ask, is there a book I can read? Or is there something I can do? No, don't read a book. Come do it. Come do it until you, you, it starts to click. And um, if you don't know what you're doing, just be quiet and just look at the pages. And before you know it, it's almost like if you want to find out how to get to a certain place, you have to get lost, really, when you're driving and not always follow your ways or, or, the, or the directions. If you can get lost and find your way back, you'll, you'll never forget how to get there. And I think it's a similar thing in, in, in learning to understand intuitively what the prayer book is trying to get us to do and what the movements of the liturgy are. Then we will, complete, we will understand it on a fundamental um, spiritual level and not just simply an intellectual one that I know how this works. Now I get it. Does that make sense? I mean, now I get it, um, especially uh, morning and evening prayer. Okay, let's close with the... Uh, there is actually a feast day in the, in the church for the first book of Common Prayer, which is appointed for um, Monday after um, Pentecost, because the first book of Common Prayer was mandated to be used um, Pentecost Day, 1549. Let's pray. Almighty and ever-living God, whose servant Thomas Cranmer with others did restore the language of the people in the prayers of thy church. Make us always thankful for this heritage and help us so to pray in the Spirit and with the understanding that we may worthily magnify thy holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen.